Well, welcome everybody to uh, the University of New Haven's webinar on the five impacts of COVID on investigations. And my name is Nicole Forschler Horn. I'm your hostess for tonight, and my job will be to introduce our fantastic panel. Um, we're going to kick this off with Patrick Malloy. Um, Patrick, go ahead and unmute yourself. And Patrick is going to give us an overview of our agenda. We'll take a quick look at the Masters in Investigations program, which is driving our webinar today and then we'll dive into the five trends. Um, after the five trends, if you're interested in getting your master's degree and exploring more about this topic, um, because the, the master's degree at the University of New Haven is constantly changing to stay relevant to what's happening in the world, um, you'll have a chance to meet Alexis, Alexa, and Alexa will tell us about her experience as a student, then we'll answer any questions you have and send you on your way. So Patrick, I'll let you um, kick us off with a quick look at our master's degree in investigations. Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Patrick Malloy. I'm the director of the master's degree in investigations. <clears throat> One thing that's unique about our degree is it is fully flexible. Um, depending upon your career choice, your experience, your previous education, you could basically build your own degree. You, you, you go through our guidance and you check through what we have. And you, don't, uh, you, you might say, I don't need this course. Can I take something else? And I will gladly help you do that. Um, it's 100% online. Yes, some students are going to complete it in a year. I have so, so, ooh, several students that do five courses each semester though I don't recommend that if you're working. Um, there's a 50% discount for sworn peace officers and active duty um, firefighters, 20% discount for professional organizations. If you're wondering which ones, you can email us and we'll give you the list. Um, we have educational partnerships with quite a few organizations such as the IAFCI, ACAMS, uh, the National Healthcare Anti-Fraud Association, that's just a few of them. And we do have three nice concentrations, one in financial crimes, one in digital forensics, and one in criminal investigations. You can blend the courses however you want. Um, you can do financial and cybercrime investigations, criminal investigations, but take some stuff in the financial crime world. Uh, that is totally up to you, and we can tailor the degree to meet your needs. Yeah, um, and, and I know that um, frequently you have students who reach out and to make sure that there's alignment in their coursework with what they want to do long term. So, yes, yes. Basically, uh, there is one required course. That's the, uh, the, the capstone course, INBS 6690. Otherwise, we can rebuild the degree. To, if you're going into the private sector, you don't want to be taking law enforcement classes, so we change those out. Great. All right, well, Patrick, thanks so much. I'm going to mute you and I'm going to uh, shut off your video. And then I'm what I am going to do is um, I'd like to have I'd like to introduce everyone to Alana Lavelle. And Alana has spent 25 years in the FBI where she investigated and managed global human trafficking cases in Colombia and Ecuador. She also led a joint terrorism task force in Atlanta. Um, and is an experienced FBI profiler. And um, Alana, if you want to go ahead and take over, we're going to talk about our first topic, and that is the increase in healthcare fraud. It's all you. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We Great, can. thanks. So, healthcare fraud is the elephant in the room. It's, it has been for several years now. And it's estimated that between 3 and 10% of the U.S. annual health care expenditure is lost due to health care fraud, waste, and abuse. And that can easily be up to $300 billion. Um, today, I wanted to talk about the, the complications of COVID-19 and how that's affected the health care system. And it might potentially add 38 to 120 billion more dollars in fraud, waste, and abuse to the, the domain next year. 
So some of the things that are affected by healthcare fraud, uh, telemedicine has been around for a while, but it is now increasing exponentially. Last year, telemarketers colluded with durable medical equipment companies and committed a fraud with um, some nefarious prescribers to bill for unnecessary durable medical equipment to the tune of $1.2 billion. It was a worldwide case and cited as one of the biggest cases in history. Telemedicine, of course, is in, on the increase. Um, we're starting to see unlicensed individuals conducting telemedicine visits. We're seeing um, upcoding. They're billing for services um, more complex than, than they're actually providing. And we're seeing a lot of services not rendered. So this is especially an area we're going to keep an eye on for the next um, couple of years. We're starting to see laboratory fraud. There's so much testing for COVID-19 and it appears that the fraudsters are coming out of the woodwork. We're starting to see fake COVID-19 tests, fake vaccines, fake treatments, and even fake hydroxychloroquine, which they've substituted saline water for in order to just make a buck. So it's out there. We're seeing um, a lot of the laboratory fraud um, that's involved with add-on um, tests. For example, if you go in for a COVID-19 test, um, Medicare will probably pay about $100. But in order to um, bring in more money, they're adding genetic testing, and other experimental tests that are not medically necessary, which has really caused an uptick in that type of laboratory fraud. There's kickback arrangements going on where a lot of the um, providers are colluding with some of the durable medical equipment and pharmaceutical companies. So that has been on the increase. There's payment policy risks because due to the um, public health emergency, Medicare has provided um, a number of waivers to providers that are billing. They have um, set aside a lot of the audits that they were doing and they've lifted a lot of the edits that were in the claim system. So this has caused um, a real uptick in basically un an unprecedented surge of loosened healthcare regulations and there are uh, folks out there that are taking advantage of this leniency and preying on people's fears while they're billing in unprecedented numbers. Um, I talked about services not rendered. There's also um, counterfeit um, PPE out there and there's um, gouging taking place. So there's um, a number of issues that we're looking at and trying to maintain um, with some, with some um, integrity because the, the, uh, the fraudsters are really using a combination of fear and um, greed going after our healthcare fraud system at this time. You Thank you. See, that, that's great, Alana. And you can see just in that uh, listing you have, this is just healthcare fraud that investigations is impacting in the, the plethora of topics that are coming out during the pandemic. Um, we're going to transition now to financial fraud, which is also on the increase. Uh, Tiffany, Mc, Tiffany McLee is joining us, and she is a certified anti-money laundering specialist and a fraud threat intelligence manager for Ally Financial. And Tiffany, go ahead and unmute yourself and feel free to put on your camera if you'd like. Uh, take us through what you're seeing and what you're hearing about and um, what we should be aware of and what, can, what we can do. Hi, can you hear me, Nicole? I can, go for it. Yeah, I'm having issues with my video actually. My computer's okay. freezing up on me. Well, we'll <laughs> you. As long as we can hear you, me. that's what's important. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, so good evening, everyone. In addition to my uh, role with Ally, I act, actually act as Ally's uh, liaison to the National Cyber Forensics and Training Alliance. So this allows me the ability to collaborate with multiple financial institutions 
to share and discuss the um, different fraud and cyber threats that are really impacting our financial institutions. So as you guys can imagine, over the past several months, COVID-19 has been the topic of our discussions. And today I just wanna give you a brief overview of some of the fraud trends that we are seeing um, as it relates to COVID-19. First, we are seeing a huge increase in phishing attacks. And as you all know, phishing attacks occur daily. Um, criminals never let up. But when you have a major event, such as a natural disaster, or in this case, a pandemic, these attacks are amplified and the actors will just exploit the fears and vulnerabilities of people to get them to um, click on malicious links, download attachments, et cetera. Within this phishing campaigns that we are seeing, um, criminal actors are leveraging the COVID-19 themes in their messaging. So, you know, they may um, include information, say they're including information about, you know, vaccines, um, how to access PPE, just general information about the pandemic, and that helps lure individuals into clicking on those malicious links. Um, they, you know, who are they targeting? They're targeting pretty much everyone, you know, us as regular citizens, but also people in the different sectors, such as manufacturing, um, individuals that are manufacturing companies that are involved with the vaccines and the PPE, as well as healthcare professionals. And then right now, the small businesses, small businesses who are applying for the CARES Act loan, they are um, purporting to be representatives of the CARES Act and informing these small businesses that they need to um, obtain additional information and signatures before they can proceed with a loan. And then they're actually just infecting our devices with malware. Now, as we all shift um, to this work from home environment and utilize these teleconferencing platforms like Zoom, we're seeing criminal actors actually target these platforms with phishing emails to obtain credentials of these platforms so that they can gain access to meetings that you're having with your colleagues and bosses. Uh, additionally, when it comes to fraud, we're seeing uh, severe high levels of fraud from all across the spectrum. And when you are successful, when criminals are successful in conducting these phishing attacks, then that allows them the ability to obtain uh, PII, so you know your username and passwords, but also your access to your financial accounts. And then what they're doing is use that information to com commit fraud themselves, or they're actually selling it on the dark web to others who can commit fraud. So right now we're seeing a huge increase in first party fraud. And for those who may not be familiar with first, first party fraud, that is when an individual actually use their real name and information to open up an account strictly for the purpose of either committing fraud or laundering money. Secondly, we're seeing uh, fraud associated with the stimulus checks. So uh, counterfeit checks, they are, you know, criminals and fraudsters are depositing counterfeit checks through mobile remote deposit capture. So remember, you know, the branches are closed, so they can't physically go into the bank, which works to their advantage. So they can utilize their mobile devices to deposit these fraudulent checks and then withdraw the funds before the financial institution realizes that the check was actually counterfeit. Um, third, a new trend that we are seeing, which has been over the past week and a half, is unemployment benefits fraud. And the United States Secret Service recently issued an alert on this, uh, which they link it to a large Nigerian fraud, scheme, uh, fraud ring operating throughout the United States. And this is where criminals are actually opening up accounts, mules, or open up accounts at multiple financial institutions throughout the United States, strictly for the purpose of receiving fraudulent unemployment benefit funds. Now, these funds are coming from different states, but the account holder name, um, the individual that owns the account name is different from the funds that are being received. So for example, Tiffany McLee owns the account, but I'm receiving um, unemployment benefits with Patrick Malloy's name on it. And also the location of the individuals and where the money is coming from is different. I live in Pennsylvania, but I'm receiving unemployment benefits from the state of Washington. So this is a really um, new, new trend that we're seeing as being impacted by multiple financial institutions. And we expect it to increase as um, more states are initiating their unemployment benefits and more mules are opening up accounts throughout the United States. One of the areas um, also that is not necessarily fraud, but it has been a huge concern for financial institutions itself is the shifting 99% um, of our workforce to remote, uh, remote environments. So there's always the security concerns that you have to be aware of when your employees are at working from home where they can potentially transmit customer information to personal devices 
but also need to be looking out for the passive devices within your house. So Alexa, um, Siri, baby monitors, those devices have been hacked into in the past by criminals, so they can be do so now, and then they can gain information when you're having these tele, um, your Zoom calls or you know WebEx meetings. They can be listening in on the sensitive information that you're discussing with your coworkers. And lastly, um, as it relates to money laundering, this is this pandemic has made it very attractive for criminals to um, recruit individuals to become money mules to launder funds. And they're doing this through the use of social media, which has been amplified through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and utilizing um, work from home scams and work romance scams to actually be able to recruit individuals. Now, as we know, the economy is going pretty bad. So you have individuals who are more vulnerable to scams as they're looking to earn extra money. So they may become victims of work from home scams. But then you also have individuals who are becoming you know, desperate to be able to take care of their families and turn it towards a life of crime and fraud to be able to support um, support their loved ones. So we are seeing um, a huge increase in money laundering activity by people that you wouldn't suspect that would be involved in the activity, but then also your general scam victims who are involved as well. And in um, contemporary topics of money laundering, we touch on a lot of this with the romance scams and work from home scams and money mules. Um, so if anybody's interested, and taking that course in the summer and in the fall, I do teach that we dive into this a little bit more, a uh, little deeper. Uh, so this is a very, just a few front fraud trends that we're seeing from the financial side. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the end of the webinar for anyone that may have any specific um, questions related to any of the information that I went over. And um, Nicole, I'll pass it back over to you. Great, thanks, Tiffany. Uh, we're going to move from financial fraud to human trafficking. Um, and we're going to hear from J.R. Helmig on human trafficking. So J.R., go ahead and unmute yourself while I talk a little bit about you. J.R. spent 25 years solving big data challenges for, for, for the Fortune 500, the US government, and uh, the global com intelligence community. He's the former chief analytics officer for SAS federal, a SAS federal government unit. So a lot of background in um, investigations and was ready to talk with us about the impact that COVID is having on human trafficking. JR, I'll let you take it over. Uh, thank you, Nicole. And hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor uh, and I teach two courses in asymmetric threats, uh, one where students develop a real life attack scenario against a target. Basically, how do you blow something up or destroy it? And then a follow on course where you then have to teach uh, or build a defense against that attack. So, you know, look for those in the fall. Those are INVS 6672 and 6679 if you're interested. Uh, we'll be developing a course specific to fraudsters because, quite frankly, for fraudsters, COVID represents the opportunity of a lifetime. And while much attention is understandably paid to the healthcare aspects, uh, we are also starting to see and to be able, very unfortunately, to measure an uptick in other negative aspects, uh, addiction, domestic abuse, child exploitation, negative behaviors, attacks, um, those kinds of things, just because people are trapped in harmful home environments. And one example where that's going to get worse is human trafficking. So just to clarify, human trafficking is not the same as human smuggling. Smuggling is where I want someone to move me from point A to point B, perhaps to avoid immigration control, or I want to move contraband such as narcotics. Trafficking is where I am being moved against my will. And while sometimes a smuggling customer, if I can use that term, does become duped, and then by force becomes a trafficking victim, smuggling and trafficking are still two separate issues. So globally, it's estimated that one out of every 185 people is a victim of modern slavery. And in order to have a modern slavery, you know, trafficking is the component of how the slaves are moved and controlled. The victims often face sexual abuse, rape, uh, forced prostitution, but there's also the unpaid or underpaid labor category where they are performing, especially children, in unsafe and inhumane conditions. Uh, and then at the worst case, we often see, or we are starting to see more of involuntary organ harvesting. So, you know, there's a black market for kidneys and where better to get a kidney than a slave. Uh, so that it's, it's, it's the dark side of humanity, unfortunately. 
So this is a global issue. It often is run by coordinated and complex transnational organized criminal groups. And the next slide will show uh, one such network uh, that we work to exploit uh, or to, to uh, attack with. Um, and Nicole, if you wouldn't mind uh, pushing the next slide, please. Thank you. This had victims from China and some were lured with the promise of high paying jobs in Europe. They were smuggled into Eastern Europe and then to France. And so they came from China, went all the way through to France, and then the entire marketing or the, the direction of the human trafficking organization was to move people into South America and then move money back from South America to Europe. Uh, this particular network was uh, pretty violent, and what they would do is separate the families or separate the groups of people so that you know one person would be in Colombia, one person would be in Brazil, and the person in Brazil would be told, if you don't do what we tell you to do, we're going to hurt your, your sister or your brother in Colombia. So, so this, is, this is pretty dark. Um, and then also you can see that across Africa, uh, and there's this huge nexus of, of slave labor going into Saudi Arabia and the, the Gulf states, uh, especially as they have these building uh, booms, if you will. So one of the reasons that you have the, a change now with COVID is number one, the travel patterns have all changed. So, you know, you have 95% drop in air travel, similar for rail travel. So those that are, you know, the good guys and gals that are tracking the bad actors and trying to help the victims, there's kind of this pause where we figure out what is the new normal in the near future. So we have to identify new patterns of behavior, not only of good people, but also of bad actors. We have to identify what can be monitored and we have to be able to create new investigative leads very, very quickly. So the next slide shows you just how varied some of these conditions and countries are. You can see there in the text, this is on demand. If you want to have a person of a certain age, gender, ethnicity, um, in a certain location, these people are being moved. Now, again, we in the West hear about things like food security and unemployment and crashing stock market. But in Africa, it was already going to be a bad year. Food production was ravaged. Uh, the locust, uh, they, have, they have this locust famine uh, that's occurring. It's destroyed over 170,000 acres of land. So the, the food harvest was already challenged. And now COVID is expected to kill another three to 500,000 people and to push another 29 million into extreme poverty. And that's what the UN defines as living on less than $1.90 a day. That's $1.90 a day. So we're gonna see people migrate elsewhere, which is gonna increase the amount of human trafficking and slavery. It is a vicious cycle. Now, some good news in the past 10 years, uh, there's been an increased awareness at the policy level, the regulatory level, as well as with law enforcement and public-private partnerships. So as I mentioned, the university, you know, we teach a human trafficking class, we teach financial investigation classes, but there's also things that you can do outside of academia and outside of your work, um, the Noble Group, uh, the Global Fund and Modern Slavery, Polaris, those are all NGOs. In my day job, I work for SAS. We're a global big data and artificial intelligence company, and we are putting human trafficking alerting procedures into the back-end systems for the world's largest financial institutions and law enforcement organizations. So when a certain series of transactions occurs in a certain pattern or with a certain frequency uh, or with certain individuals that we suspect might be human traffickers, um, or facilitators of human trafficking, then we alert the, the law enforcement or the bank to, to look for it. So this is a horrific problem. I would encourage you to get some awareness of it and get involved. Uh, and, and then also, you know, pick a discipline inside UNH's um, uh, portfolio, whether it be investigations or cyber crimes or forensic. And so you can learn how to detect the networks, identify changes in those behaviors uh, for both the human trafficking uh, customer, if you will, as well as the facilitators, and then conduct and lead investigations. So, Nicole, I'll stand by for questions afterwards, but thank you. That's, that was sad and terrifying how the, this map blew me away. So thank you so much. I appreciate it, JR. Alana, we're going back to you to talk about identity theft and COVID. And if you can come back online, take yourself off mute, and talk a little bit about how COVID-19 is impacting and we're seeing an increase in identity theft. That's absolutely correct. We have seen an uptick in ID theft um, based on COVID. In fact, um, the econ economic stimulus checks 
um, have been going all over the country. And we identified a case last week where a, an individual was, was conspiring with prisoners in the Federal Bureau of Prison System to get their checks cashed and she would take 20% and give them the rest. Um, that's a big exclusion on those checks. There should not be any checks going into the, into the prisoners in the Bureau of Prison or even in the local jails. But that was one of the first um, clever conspiracies we saw based on some of these payments. Um, there's a lot of phishing emails. Tiffany described those. We're seeing a, a lot of telemarketing to seniors. Um, they, the fraudsters would like nothing more than to obtain the tele, to obtain the Medicare number from seniors along with their social security number and, and date of birth. Um, on the dark web, we have um, discovered that um, a social security number often goes for $25 or $50 per number, but now a healthcare um, identification number may go upwards to $500 to $600. And this is based on the fact that they can quickly use your Medicare number or your Blue Cross number to do a lot of fraudulent billing very quickly. And now's the time when they've relaxed a lot of the payment policies where these claims will get through and you can move through a lot of these stolen IDs very quickly. Um, I wanted to talk about identity cloning because we've seen an interesting phenomena where a lot of the physician's identities are being stolen and, and cloned. Um, the national provider ID is, is um, what they need to do a lot of billing in Medicare and in, in other um, domains. But especially now during um, telemedicine, where there's a lot of um, individuals that are, are preferring to use telemedicine instead of um, direct office visits, the fraudsters are stealing and cloning physicians' identities so that they can bill um, telemedicine. And oftentimes they're billing um, more hours than there are in a day. Um, just because they can and, and they're, they're paying them pretty quickly. There's just been such a, a, an uptick in a lot of the, uh, the billing for this. Another um, sad part of um, the relaxation of payment policies is they now allowed opioid prescribing by telemedicine and they're also allowing refills by phone. So we're seeing a lot of identities of um, individuals being stolen so that they can obtain their drugs um, expeditiously, you know, either by telemedicine or even refills by phone, which is unprecedented. So unfortunately, the, uh, the overdoses have not um, gone down during this period and suicides are also up, they say, by 64%. Um, the dark web is where uh, a lot of the, uh, the exchange of stolen um, identities, stolen PII, everything takes place. Um, and just to give you an example, we, my husband and I use USAA insurance and credit cards. And I recently got a notification that they saw both of our names and identities in the dark web. So I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with that, but um, it was a, a shock to me. But I think with all these breaches recently, um, it's to be expected. So back to you, Nicole. Thank you. Oh, that's unnerving, though, Alana. That is absolutely unnerving. It is. All right. We're going to wrap up our five trends with a look at elder exploitation. Uh, Richard Colangelo Jr. is joining us and his name might sound familiar to you because he is, the, he is Connecticut's chief state's attorney. And as the chief state attorney, he is the chief law enforcement officer responsible for investigating and prosecuting all criminal matters in Connecticut. So no small job. And um, Rich was ready to jump in on any one of these topics because of all the cases he's seen 
recently come across uh, his radar in Connecticut. But we told him for now, just to focus on elder exploitation, but you can certainly ask him um, and any one of our presenters any number of questions. Um, but Rich, I'll turn it over to you to talk about elder exploitation. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so as Nicole said, guys, I mean, we are seeing more and more scams and exploitations with COVID-19. I mean, as far as the elder exploitation goes, I mean, you have a, a segment of the population that is, uh, you know, we are trying to protect. So people are preying on that, you know, hey, you need to stay and you need to be protected you know, by offering them that, you know, the home test kits for COVID-19 that don't exist. Um, you know, the, the saddest thing to see is, you know, someone purchasing an elixir um, you know, because it's going to prevent them from getting COVID or cure it if they have gotten it. And, and people are, you know, getting hit with these phishing emails. Um, they are out there and, and people are falling for them, unfortunately, because they're trying to protect themselves. You know, one of the other things that we're seeing and, and kind of along the lines of what the others have spoken about, you know, those impersonating the government agency or, um, you know, the stimulus related scams. Hey, you know, if you want to get your check faster, you know, click on this link and fill out your information for us and we'll be able to get it to you, you know, a week quicker. Or we want to, you know, we got an email, uh, you know, I'm sure you all get them too. I got an email the other day telling me that my um, Bank of America account was uh, corrupted or uh, frozen because there was uh, fraudulent activity on it. And, you know, I'll get that email and I'll realize that, hey, you know what, it's really, this is fake or it's a fraud. Uh, my mother gets that email and she's calling me up, you know, Richie, what's going on with my bank account? I have to call. I have to see what's going on. And, and she might click on that link to, to confirm her uh, banking information or her account number and her password. And then now we have somebody getting access to uh, her account or her information. So we're seeing that happening, uh, unfortunately, more and more in these times. And the last thing that is, you know, probably one of the saddest things are the, the charity scams, people that are setting up, you know, fake charities to, to benefit nursing organizations or healthcare organizations and people are giving and, you know, and the elderly are seeing the news and seeing what these people are doing, the frontline workers, and, and they really want to help them. So they're getting sucked into these scams. So, um, you know, if you haven't noticed, guys, everybody that's been speaking to you today, um, we are instructors or, or, or adjuncts in, in Patrick's program and the investigative program at the MS, the master's program, sorry, at, at, uh, at UNH. Um, so, you're, you know, your instructors or teachers are going to be, you know, practitioners that are going to give you real world experience and, in, in, you know, kind of really timely information. So, um, Nicole, I'm going to turn it back over to you so we can answer everybody's questions and, uh, you know, because really that's what they're here for. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I first want to introduce Alexa Cognetta. Um, Alexa is in the program. Alexa is almost done with the program. And um, she is the assistant co controller at a private equity fund, uh, Loan Core Capital. She's also a CPA in Connecticut. Um, and we wanted to have Alexa join us um, to share her experience going through the program. And after Alexa is done talking, I'm going to have ask all of our um, presenters to be on camera if they're able to. I think JR can't, but um, everyone else to join us on camera and we'll answer any questions you might have. So Alexa, go ahead and, and tell us a little bit about your experience going through the master's degree in investigations. Uh, yeah, thank you, Nicole. Um, so as you know, I'm in uh, the Master of Investigations program. I'm actually finishing a concentration in financial crimes. Uh, as you can see from the screen, I actually have no prior experience in investigations um, or have a background in it. I happened upon this program roughly two years ago when I decided to transition into, invest into a more investigative career. Uh, I was excited to find this unique program. I felt like it would equip me with the foundational skills that would allow me to transition from my current career um, and capitalize on my existing proficiencies, experiences, uh, and education as an accountant. I think coming into this program, the biggest perceived challenge for me was it was online learning 100% and time management since you don't have a set class time every week. Um, but I found that the program was truly uh, truly excelled in allowing me to turn these perceived negatives into positives. 
Uh, the professors are extremely understanding and flexible. They tell you what to expect up front and it's up to you to make your own schedule and mold your coursework in a way that best suits you and your aspirations and needs. Uh, as you can see from all the individuals on the panel today, they're all working, well-known, reputable professionals, um, and they're here because they want to be here. And they make it known by giving you multiple ways to contact them. They're completely open to offline conversations regarding job opportunities, networking events, even discussions on contemporary topics. I've done it myself with uh, multiple of the professors and even joined the uh, ACFE through uh, Dr. Malloy's networking uh, with these various industries and agencies that he mentioned at the beginning. So overall, I felt like this was a great investment in not just content and knowledge, um, but the connections I've made with these professors um, who are knowledgeable and, and you know, right out there in the front lines. Uh, inevitably, I think that, you know, this allowed me to find the personalized experience uh, I wanted in a program. Uh, Dr. Molloy told me from the beginning, it's your education, your investment, and you make it what you want. And I've had the opportunity to do that. Um, as uh, we've mentioned, the content's relevant, it's relatable, um, it's presented with real world application. I've had experience filling out draft subpoenas and search warrants. I've labeled and photographed a mock crime scene, uh, performed investigative searches on the dark web, and uh, even researched and studied more contemporary fraud cases. So you'll certainly get a, a bevy of experiences and knowledge and information. Uh, and I think that you know it'll allow you to figure out what your career aspirations are and work toward that. Alexa, I love that. That's fantastic. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to stop sh sharing my screen um, for a moment and allow our, um, I'd like to have our presenters also go ahead and um, go ahead and, and take your, put your video on. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so hold on one second. This is the first time, I will admit to everyone, this is the first time we've used the <laughs> Zoom webinars. Um, so it's a, it's a new experience um, for us to try and do this. Um, oh, I'm, here we go. Start my video. Hopefully we'll get a chance to start everybody else's video as well. Um, I'm going to, I'll try and do that while we go. Um, but we've got, we've got, uh, Hi, Tiffany. Welcome. Um, we do have uh, a few questions in here, so um, let me take a look at that while we're, while we are, okay. Um, JR, I think you and I were talking about this, or Rich, it might have been you, but one of, I was, before we got started, I started to, one of you were telling me that big concern right now is um, the increase in online online sex and not in a consensual kind of way. Um, and Rich, was that you and I talking about that? It was. I mean, and one of the things that, you know, in this COVID-related world where we are, you know, everybody's home, um, investigators are kind of stay away from people, don't go into different places. So, you know, we have uh, the sexual exploitation units, if you will, you know, the state police and the units like them, um, you know, collecting the cyber tips as they're getting as far as people that are trying to exploit children online. Um, you know, as, as soon as the reins are loosened a little bit, I, I feel bad for the criminals because there are, you know, a good 50 search warrants that are going to be happening. And uh, some people are going to be surprised when the, the cops come knocking on their door at, you know, five o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah, no kidding, no kidding. Um, Alexa, one question that I'm seeing on here is you talked about um, having access to the instructors. Can you talk a little bit about any access you've had to, um, have you built up relationships with other students? Yes, uh, I think that was also a concern coming in was not having that peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Um, but I think if you take the initiative, everybody is looking for that opportunity to engage with their peers. I, for one, have uh, emailed, texted, and even had phone calls with students in my classes, especially when there's a question or an issue. Um, and even for me, just 
networking, networking, networking. I think everybody's open to talk about themselves and their backgrounds and where they came from. So if you put in the effort, I think everybody's willing to open up the floor to have a conversation. Patrick or Dr. Malloy, but I just like calling you Patrick and I feel like most of your students do as well. Yes, they do. <laughs> I, got, I, got the, I got the doctorate for the poofy hat and the stripes on the sleeve at graduation. Otherwise, don't call me doctor. <laughs> Patrick, why don't you talk a little bit about um, Alexa touched on uh, Alexa touched on really trying to customize the creation of the mm -hmm. of the programs. Talk a little bit about how how frequently are new classes being offered, new classes being developed. Um, like, are we going to see things in the fall coming out about COVID and the impact of pandemics on investigations? Because I work with you on this program all the time, and I feel like you're constantly bombarding us with new classes. Uh, yes, we have some in the work. Uh, JNR, JR and I have uh, discussed some stuff on uh, the pandemic investigations and such. Uh, Alana and I are, are in discussions with another group in the whole healthcare fraud investigations field. Actually, we're looking to potentially build the, the only degree like that in the country. Uh, Tiffany has come up with ideas. Every one of my faculty members, they have an idea. I'm going to run with it. Uh, I may be a little restricted due to, you know, circumstances at the universities around the world, you know, um, with funding, but I can have things done. Uh, I've only created about 60 something courses in the last five years. Uh, only. <laughs> only. Um, but we're always looking for innovative ideas that are relevant, can bring students into current careers, blending different courses. And as I said, even with the, uh, even with the degree, it's the person coming into the university, it's they're looking for something that's going to work for them. Great. So we build that for them. I, I, I do, I change, I, I think I only have a handful of students that I don't change degrees for. Yeah. Um, well, I will, I will reiterate, if you have a question, please put it in, uh, there's, a, there's a box where you can type in the questions. I'll also keep my eyes open on chat. Alana, um, there's a question here specifically for you, and it's, um, it's from James Ward, and he said, what, how would you train or prepare a seasoned investigator in police investigations to transition to a post le law enforcement career in healthcare investigations. And he asked, and Patrick, you can probably also d jump in, does the certificate program or a few courses bring the student up to speed? What are your recommendations? Well, I teach a, a, um, a master's level course in healthcare fraud investigations and coupled with another course in healthcare fraud analytics. And with the combination of both of them, we have a very exhaustive um, curriculum that, that really covers all the analytics, all the clinical guidances, policies, um, the statutes, all the law that you need to know, and um, tips and tricks to be an investigator in that domain. So I've actually helped a few students um, launch into different insurance company special investigation units um, following the, the course. Um, it gave them a, you know, a leg up. And I, and I would say if you're going to invest in, uh, in some classes, um, invest at least in the certificate programs. So that's something you have on a resume. And time and time again, we see that a master's also better positions people for management level. So in terms of making that transition, if you combine a certificate and a master's degree, a certificate and or a master's degree, I think that's more compelling, um, especially as we're looking at uh, the unemployment rates to make sure that your resume rises to the top. Right, uh, exactly. And I would also um, advise everyone to take courses at the National Healthcare Anti-Fraud Association conferences. Those are, the, it's the premier um, association in the country for healthcare fraud students and practitioners. Great. And that's why, that's why I like working with you. <laughs> 
So I have a question from Emily, but Emily, you, your question, um, and then I have a, that's a more general question on investigations, and then one from uh, Jackie Parker, and Jackie, I'll get to you after I ask this one. Um, the question is, what type of nation state activity are we seeing since the pandemic began? And what type of state-sponsored terrorist attacks are we most worried about during the pandemic? Yeah, so uh, JR here, I'll, I'll jump in on that one, Nicole. Um, first of all, we're seeing a uh, exponential increase in cyber attacks and industrial espionage or industrial theft against companies trying to battle COVID. So healthcare companies that are trying to treat patients, uh, research groups at pharmaceutical companies, legal firms that are handling uh, research and development or patent uh, work, for example. And we're also, trying, we're also seeing uh, this as an opportunity where bad actors are trying to attack individuals uh, within the COVID environment. So uh, whether it's at the organizational level, uh, Department of Health and Human Services has an ex or WHO, World Health Organization, has an exponential increase in cyber and phishing attacks, but also key individuals inside the research and development or inside their uh, treatment centers. Um, all of those are increasing and, and also the disinformation. So it's like, I'm trying to steal all your good information and I'm trying to give you all bad information uh, because that creates dis uh, disenchantment within the ranks. So those are a couple of key examples. Those are great. Um, Jackie Parker wants to know, she says, I have a BA in English with a minor in psychology. And this is a question, Patrick, we get all the time. And that is, what, what might my path be like for the master's in investigations for a career? Like, uh, and we get asked this all the time. Do I have to have that law enforcement background? Can I come in kind of blind? And if I come in with, um, with and Jackie, I'm a philosophy major, so I, I understand where you're coming from. If I come in with that kind of background, can I trans, do I, will I still be able to transition into investigations? And Patrick, why don't you answer that? Okay. Um, two things that make you succeed, successful in the program, an inquisitive mind, and that you can write good. Write well. <laughs> Somebody should correct me on that one. Um, so basically, the inquisitive mind is, is, is an analytical mind. And all investigations are based on analytics of some sort or another. It's, it's your, 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 your vision and your, your, your mental capacity is aligning what you're seeing and what you're hearing and what what is happening around you, the situational awareness aspects. If you have those, those concepts down, the world of investigations gets a lot easier. I think uh, several of my investigators here could probably um, back me up on that one, right, Rich? Yeah, no, I mean, and it, it's coming at it from a different perspective is, is great, honestly, and not having that you know, criminal justice background to come into it because it gives you a different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, to, to, to look at things. You're not kind of, cops are cops, right? They're trained to do it this way. And it's refreshing to get that different perspective and that kind of, well, geez, you didn't, you know, you thought of it this way or come at it from a different way. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's what we try to encourage with all our students. And the thing about the program is you get a nice blend of law enforcement folks in your class, even though you're not law enforcement. So you get well, the, one of someone is asking that question right now. Like, what's the percentage breakdown of? Is it about half and half law enforcement? Probably no. about half and half right now. Okay. Um, uh, but both sides keep pace with each other. We get a lot coming in that are non-law enforcement, um, and those that really aren't interested in a law enforcement investigative field are going into our private investigations field, such as in healthcare fraud investigations or. Uh, money laundering or, you know, where they're not going out to arrest people, then they're going to take different courses that are more relevant to building that knowledge set. The skill will come along right. with the knowledge because you're learning from people who are doing this in the field. And Patrick, people, on the forensic side, you know, we're seeing people come in that aren't law enforcement, but it, it's strange now, 10 years ago, we didn't see this, but now every corporation has a, a forensic unit in it. I mean, mm -hmm. all the, all the insurance companies, all of the healthcare companies, you know, they have a forensic forensic capabilities in house. So, you know, we're seeing people that, you know, hey, I want to be a cop and I want to be CSI. I want to do this stuff. Well, you don't have to do that in, in, on the law enforcement. You could do it in private industry. Mm -hmm. you make a lot more money. Yeah. Well, uh, 
so Patrick, kind of a relevant question that I'm seeing is um, someone is asking in terms of career growth, is a master's program like this one better than obtaining a specific certification like a certified cyber forensic professional or a certified information security manager? Um, so what would you what would you say to that question? Oh, can you repeat that for me? Um, someone, Michael, uh, Michael asks, in terms of career growth in the field, would this master's program be a better option than obtaining a specific certification, like a certified cyber forensic professional okay. information security manager? He's uh, currently a wire transfer investigator for a bank, and he's looking for ways to improve himself as well as to advance within the company, and he's trying to decide which direction to go in. Okay. Um as when people see my name, they don't see CPI after it or CFE or any of the other. I'm not a person who believes in having the credentials if I'm not using them. Uh, I mean, I've had people come up to me and tell me, well, listen, I just passed the CFE, CFE exam. I can teach for you. Well, no, you cannot. The credential doesn't teach you the basics of the investigation process. It just covers the material in an exam. What you get through the master's degree program is the relevant experiential learning impact of learning from the professionals in the field that will sometimes be in conflict with the material that you're studying for on, a, on an exam. And, you know, I, I saw that the, when I did my CPA exam, it was the same thing. I, I, yeah, I got to see CPA, I, you know, I still practice. Um, but that credential, anybody can basically get to credential. It doesn't really mean that you've mastered subject matter. Great. Um, Nicole, can I jump in on that one? JR for one second. So I hire a lot of people and sit on a lot of hiring boards. So what I would simply say is that um, a master's provides you a lot better breadth and depth, but also you can always get a master's with a cyber focus. Um, and that will give you much more, uh, many more opportunities yeah. than simply going for a CCFP or a CISM. Uh, because, you know, the, the executives that are hiring uh, for top dollar, those kinds of credential people, they're first looking for the well-rounded folks that understand what a business ecosystem and a, an operational ecosystem entail. And it's very tough to get that if you're so narrowly focused as a credential only. Uh, so Great. I would encourage the masters first. Um, so we're running out of time. Um, I, I have two more questions. One is from Brad about um, human trafficking activity, but I want, I want Alexa to answer Mark Fellman's question, and he wants to know, um, are interactive investigation scenarios part of the curriculum and regarding courses which focus heavily on investigation techniques? And he wanted to hear from you, although Patrick might jump in as well. So um, his question is, are interactive investigation scenarios part of the curriculum? And then um, he wants to know which courses focus heavily on investigation techniques. And Mark, I can uh, I can have somebody reach out to you to talk. Patrick can probably talk offline with you about that part of the question. But Alexa, can you talk about the interactiveness of the investigation scenarios? Uh, yes. So I took uh, a regular investigations one course. Uh, that was the first course I took coming into the program with no prior investigations experience. Uh, and as I briefly mentioned, they had us filling out search warrants based on actual cases that took place um, within a police department. Um, obviously, a lot of the names were you know, blacked out, remained anonymous, but we actually had to read through the case files, read through the uh, officer's reports, and fill out um, the search warrants that would be required to you know, to get the evidence that, that we were looking for. Uh, I also just rolled off of a cybercrime uh, course and that was very interactive. He had us encrypting uh, various files and data. We downloaded the Tor browser and did dark web searches. Uh, we learned how to Google ourselves, which is a very scary process when you figure out what's actually out there. Um, and even as what went as far to figure out IP lookups, how to look that up, how to, you know, triangulate cellular data to figure out locations when uh, looking into certain digital evidence. So you'll get very hands on with a lot of this. Uh, and, and like I said, I even was mocking up a, 
a crime scene and labeling it and taking photos. Uh, do I necessarily want to go into, you know, that specific law enforcement role? No, but I can say that I did that and that I have that experience under my belt and, you know, have that inquisitive mind that Dr. Malloy was talking about to really think things through and analyze the situation. So you'll get a lot of experience. Fantastic. And we are happy to follow up. Um, advisors can follow up with you and set up calls with panelists or uh, with Patrick. And if you want us to reach out, please just type in yes in the chat box and we will do that in the coming days. So just type in yes in the chat box and we'll follow up. So last question. The last question goes to JR and uh, this is coming from Brad Ennis and Brad wants to know, JR, how have human traffickers changed their travel pan patterns during pandemic? Is it too early to know? Also, France and Saudi Arabia were examples on your slide. Where would you rank the United States? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Brad, for the question. First of all, it's in my personal opinion, uh, not a corporate or UNH opinion, but USA uh, ranks high as far as awareness of human trafficking goes. There's reporting on it. There's, there's awareness and anti-trafficking efforts at banks and law enforcement and so forth. So we have a higher level of awareness and therefore a higher level of reporting. In countries where it is uh, prolific, they don't even have a law in the books that says you, you, you know, it's illegal to, to have sex with children or to move children against their will, for example. So we have to keep that in, in basis or in perspective in answering those kinds of questions. In the France and Saudi Arabia, it was one case um, and it was uh, the one I was able to get a sanitized slide out. So I'm not trying to uh, make any statements about them being worse or better than any other country. Um, but specific to how they change travel patterns now, instead of the traffickers seeing uh, that their victims come to them, we see the traffickers going to their victims because it's easier for a trafficker or for a perpetrator, the end customer, if you will, of that trafficked individual uh, on the sex trade to, to travel individually to a place to exploit a victim uh, versus a trafficker and a victim moving to another place. And they've simply moved from, from airplanes and trains to rental cars. Um, so, so we're starting to see a lot of that. A lot of, uh, 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 a lot of it's moved online. Uh, you know, uh, pornography, uh, legal and illegal, is, is up exponentially as people are at home more. Um, and so, you know, that is, that is another indicator that uh, the police and uh, lawyers are, are looking at as well. So hope that answers your question. Great. Um, well, like I said, we will be sending out um, in the next day or so uh, a video of this so you can rewatch it um, and respond to us if you have specific questions. We are here to answer your questions or I'll forward it to this panel to get the questions answered. Um, and if you want to have a, a University of New Haven advisor reach out to you or to help set up an appointment with Dr. Malloy, Dr. Malloy just write yes in the chat field and we will follow up. But I wanna thank everyone for spending time with us this evening. Thank you panelists for sharing your insights and uh, expertise. It was wonderful to hear from you guys. And I hope everyone has a great night. Stay safe.